question one. So to solve this inequality, so we need to have x in the middle on its own. So we're going to start off by minusing 1 from both. So minus 2 becomes minus 3, 7 becomes 6. So we've now got 3x in the middle. We now divide by 3. So we have minus 1 and 2. So x is greater than minus 1 and x is less than 2. Question 2. So we need to find the equation of the line which is perpendicular to this passing through that point. Okay, so let's first of all focus on the fact that it's perpendicular to this line here. So let's rearrange this to get it into y equals mx plus c format. So take away 2x from both sides, 3y equals minus 2x plus 4. Divide through by 3 and we get y equaling minus 2 thirds x plus 4 over 3. Now our line is going to be perpendicular to this, so our line is going to have a gradient where we flip this over and change the sign, so our gradient is going to be 3 over 2. So our gradient is going to be 3 over 2, and it's through the point 3 minus 1. So we can use the formula y minus y1 equals mx minus 1, where our x1, y1 is 3 minus 1, and our gradient m is 3 over 2. So y minus minus 1 equals 3 over 2 x minus 3. Minusing a minus is a plus 1, so it's y plus 1 on the left. Multiplying both sides by 2 and at the same time uh, doing the claw on the right with the 3, we get 2y plus 2 equals 3x minus 9. And uh, it doesn't state which format we have to give our answer in, so just giving it in this format we can get 3x minus 2y equals 11, or any equivalent would be fine. Question 3. So, uh, the tangent at the curve at this point, um, we know that the gradient will be what we get when we differentiate this and substitute in the x value of 4. So differentiating this curve, we get 2x minus 3, so the gradient at the point of the tangent at 4, 4, we can substitute 4 into the curve, or sorry, into the differential rather, and get 2 lots of 4 minus 3 equals 5. So we know that at the point 4, 4 on the curve, the gradient of the tangent is going to be 5. Well, we know the tangent is at the point 4, 4, so again we can use the formula y minus 1 equals m x minus x1. So we have y minus 4 equaling our gradient of 5, x minus 4. Multiplying out the right-hand side, adding 4 to both sides, we get y equaling 5x minus 16. Question 4. So, quick sketch to help us gather our thoughts. So a's at 1, 5 and b's at minus 3, 7. So to calculate the exact length of a, b, we can use Pythagoras. Well, the base is all the way from minus 3 to plus 1, which is the length of 4. Our height is from 5 to 7, which is the length of 2. So AB squared is going to be 4 squared plus 2 squared, which is 20. So AB is the square root of 20, or if you like, 2 root 5. Now for part B, to find the coordinates of the midpoint, we just have to average the X coordinates and average the Y coordinates. The average of 1 and minus 3 is minus 1 and the average of 5 and 7 is 6. Question 5. So the, we know an equation of a circle where the centre of the origin is um, x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. So we just need to work out what the radius of the circle is. So we know that the um, uh, the center is at 0, 0, and 1, 7 is a point on the line. So the radius, thinking of Pythagoras, the radius squared is going to be 1 squared plus 7 squared, which is 50. So our radius squared equals 50. So given that the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared, we have x squared plus y squared equaling 50. Now find the coordinates, plural, of the two points where the, this line cuts the circle. So what we want to do, we want to uh, take our line and rearrange it to make y the subject. 
so y equals 15 minus 2x and then we can substitute in so we're solving the simultaneous equation we can substitute in this value uh, uh, this equation for y into the equation of our circle so we've got x squared plus rather than y squared we're going to do 15 minus 2x which equals y all squared equaling 50 multiply out our pair of brackets we get this gather up our like terms on the left hand side we get this quadratic equation uh, having set it equal to 0 by taking away 50 from both sides now all three terms on the left are divisible by 5 so I can divide by 5 making this straightforward to factorize so I get x minus 7 x uh, is that right? X minus 7. Yes, that is right. My magic numbers are minus 7 and minus 5. So I've got X minus 7, X minus 5 when I factorised it equally naught. So my values for X are 7 and 5. 7 and 5. And then to find the Y values, I substitute these X values back into uh, either the line or the circle. Well, I'm going to use this revised version of the line, the 15 minus 2X y equals 15 minus 2x so when x is 7 y is 1 and when x is 5 y is 5 so the two points where that that line cuts the circle are at 7 1 and 5 5. question six so we're given this equation here and we've told it's got a number of roots use the factor theorem to find the negative roots okay so we know it's going to be a negative root, which I'm trying to find. So I've tried to substitute in. First of all, I did minus 1, minus 2, and they did not equal naught. But when I've substituted in minus 3, I get minus 3 cubed, which is minus 27. Minusing minus 3 cubed is minusing a plus 9, so minusing a 9. Minus 10 times minus 3 is plus 30, plus the 6. This does indeed equal 0 telling me that x equaling minus 3 is the negative root. Now, attempt to solve the equation, so I'm going to use um, um, long division, uh, algebraic long division, to work to, to factorise uh, my equation. So I'm, I'm taking my equation, I'm dividing that by um, the factor x plus 3. Given that minus 3 is the negative root, the factor is x plus 3. So I just worked through my long division here, so just quickly reminding ourselves how to do that. We say to ourselves, x times what gives us x cubed? Well, that's our x squared. So x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times 3 is 3x. Three so we then take this away. So x cubed take away x cubed is nothing. Minus x squared minus 3x squared is minus 4x squared and I bring down my, tiny, my minus 10x. So, um, what number, um, to get my um, minus 4x squared, I need to have x times what? Well, that's going to have to be a minus 4x. So minus 4x times x is my 4, 4x squared, my minus 4x squared, and my minus 4x times 3 is my minus 12x minus 10x minus minus 12x is 2x and I bring down my plus 6 so in order to get my 2x I need a 2 here because 2 times x is 2x 2 times x is 2x 2 times plus 3 is plus 6 and as I was expecting there's no remainder so this quadratic um, here breaks down into being factors of, of x plus 3 and x squared minus 4x plus 2. Now, um, this doesn't factorise, so in order to solve this, I could either have used the um, quadratic equation or I've just ch chosen to complete the square. So um, to complete the square, we halve the coefficient of the x, which is the minus 4. So I've got x minus 2 all squared. Now that would generate that rogue plus 4 at the end, so I need a minus 4 to back that out. So x minus 2 all squared minus 4 is the same as x squared minus 4x. Then I've also got my plus 2. Now gathering these two terms here, I get a minus 2 here. Now this is easy to unpack to solve for x. So I add 2 to both sides. 
I then square root, and when I square root, I get x minus 2 equaling plus or minus the square root of 2. Add 2 to both sides, so my second and third solutions are x equaling 2 minus root 2 and 2 plus root 2. Now I've left these second and third solutions in third format. Perfectly all right if you've gone and popped them into decimals. So here are my three solutions to the equation. Question 7. So we need to integrate that between 5 and 3. So the integral of x squared minus 7. So we, want, we add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So we get a third x cubed minus 7x. And we first of all substitute in 5 and then we substitute in 3. So when we substitute 5 into this, we get 125 over 3 minus 35. And we take away from that when we substitute 3 into this, which is when we get 9, take away 21. So that gives us 18 and 2 thirds. Now for part 2, explain by means of a sketch why the area between the curve and the lines 2 and 5 is not the integral of this. Well, this is because um, the curve between 2 and 5 crosses over the x-axis. So if you integrate between 5 and um, 2, you know, there's going to be a little bit of negative area in here, so uh, which will, um, uh, so it will, it won't give you the right answer. If you're going to integrate this properly, you would have to integrate between five and where the curve cuts the x-axis, and secondly, between where the, it cuts the x-axis and two. This little area would come out as a negative, so you'd reverse the sign of that and add it to this positive area you got here. So, because the curve cuts the x-axis, so part of the area will be negative, is your answer. Question 8. So, we need to find the probability that at least two sixes are obtained when we roll um, four dice. Okay, so, the probability of a six is, with one dice, is obviously a sixth. The probability of not getting a 6 is 5 sixths. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to work out the probability that you get no 6s and the probability you get just the 1 6. Take that away from a whole and that would give us the probability of at least two sixes. So what's the probability of getting no 6s when we throw the 4 dice? Well that's going to be 5 sixths to the power of 4 which is 0.4823. Now, what about the probability of just getting the 1 6? So that could, could be, for example, a 6, not a 6, not a 6, not a 6, but this could be in any order. So there are four ways this could happen, because obviously the, the 6 could just be in any of the four places. So there are four ways this could happen, and uh, I've got not a 6 happening three times, so that's 5 6 cubed, and a sixth happen, happening the once, so that's a sixth. So multiply that, you get 0 0.3858. So the probability of no sixes is this, the probability of one six is this, so add these two together, take it away from a whole, and that gives you 0 0.1319, which is the probability of at least two sixes. Question nine. So, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, so we differentiate velocity for that. So, differentiating the 12t squared minus t cubed, I get 24t minus 3t squared. Now, I show that the acceleration is naught when t is naught and t is 8. So, let's set the acceleration to equaling 0. So, obviously, the bracket has to be 0, the 24t minus 3t squared. Factorising this, I get my two solutions when t is 0 and t is 8. Part 2, find the distance travelled in the first 8 seconds. Well, the dis distance travelled is what happens when I integrate velocity with respect to time. So let's integrate our velocity formula. And we get um, uh, 7 over 128, 12t cubed over 3 minus a quarter t to the power of 4, and this first term simplifies to 4t cubed. 
So substitute in t being 8 and t being 0, and I get uh, this giving me 56. Question 10. So write down a formula for cos ADC. So we're looking for a um, formula for this angle here. Well, the cosine formula that we're given is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So rearranging this and making cos a the subject, I get this. So applying this to my triangle ADC, I get uh, a half a all squared plus d squared minus b squared all over, over two lots of the half a times d. Now moving on to part two and with regard to cos adb I'm now looking at the triangle adb so similar idea which is substituting in we get a half a all squared plus d squared minus c squared all over two lots of the half a times d. Now for part three, using the property that connects angles ADB and ADC, we show this and it gives us the big hint that if alpha equals 180 minus beta, then cos alpha equals minus cos beta. Well obviously what relates these two angles is that together they add up to 180 degrees. So angle um, ADC equals 180 minus ADB. So Bearing in mind the, um, the fact that the hint that they've given us, we can say that cos ADC equals minus cos ADB. So our answer from part 1 equals minus our answer from part 2. So um, just uh, what do we do then? So uh, we can then multiply through by AD, so that's cancelling the denominators. And then making, uh, taking my two, the d squared to the left by adding 2d to both sides, but taking away the other two components, I can make 2d squared the subject. Divide through by 2, I get this. And then really just to lose the half, we multiply numerator and denominator by 2, giving me this, which is what I had to show. So for part four, we've now been told the various lengths of the triangle, which I've just popped here into the diagram. So I'm just substituting the seven, the nine, and the 10 into the formula that we just had to show from part three. Gives me D equaling root 40, which is the same as two root 10. Question 11. So for part one, I'm going to use the fact that if he uses no fertilizer, the average yield is 24. So when x is 0, y equals 24, substituting that into my formula, I can see that c has to be 24 as required. Now for part two, I'm going to substitute in my other two facts. I know that when x is 2, y equals 34, and when x is 4, y equals 32. So we're going to substitute both of these facts in to generate two equations with two unknowns and then solve the simultaneous equation. So first of all, substituting in the x equaling 2 and the y equals 34. This simplifies to 2a plus b equals 9. Then substituting in x equaling 4 and y equaling 32. This uh, simplifies to 4a plus b equals 18. So equation one, equation two, two equations, two unknowns. So I've subtracted equation two from equation one to eliminate b, giving me a is nine over two and b is naught. And therefore, uh, substituting that into the formula, I do indeed get what I had to show. Now part three, use calculus to find the amount of fertilizer that should be used to maximize the yield. So we're going to differentiate our equation. So we differentiate this to get minus 3x squared plus 9x. We set this equal to 0 to work at a maximum or a minimum. Factorizing this, I get this, which gives me two solutions. My first solution is what makes this part 0, which is x being 0. Now this gives the minimum, so that can be discarded. 
My second solution comes from this bracket equaling naught, so x equals 3. So that is the amount of fertilizer I'll be using, x equaling 3. Substituting that back into the formula, I can then see that y equals 37.5. So x is 3, y equals 37.5. Question 12. So, uh, my first inequality comes from the fact that we got uh, the coach, uh, the coach can seat 10, no sorry, the minibus can seat 10 and the coach can sit 30 and we need to fit 300 people. So 10x plus 30y has got to be greater than or equal to 300. We've got to get enough seats for at least the 300 students and teachers that we've got. You must make sure you put it in being greater than or equal. We can get extra coaches and minibuses if we want, but we have to be able to sit the 300. Now secondly, I know that uh, my other two inequalities come from the total number available from the coach firm. So they've only got 15 minibuses, so X has got to be less than or equal to 15. They've only got eight coaches, so Y has got to be less than or equal to eight. Now part three is when the cost comes into play. Uh, each minibus costs 100 pounds to hire, so the cost from the minibuses is going to be 100 times X. The coaches cost 150 to hire, so each of those is going to be 150 times Y, the number of coaches we have. Now that total cost has got to be less than or equal to our maximum budget of £2,400. So there are my four inequalities. I've then sketched these down below on the graph. Um, and to sketch these, you re really just make sure you've, you just have a couple of points. You just need a couple of points to, to plot a line. So to, to plot the line 10x plus 3y equals 300, I first of all made y zero, so x would be 30. Secondly, I've made x being zero, so y would be 10. So those two points allow me to draw in the, the line where it equals 300. Obviously, x equals 15 just goes down through 15. y equaling 8 goes across through 8. And similarly with this bottom one, I've just taken a couple of points. I first of all made y zero, so x would be 24. Secondly, I've made x zero, so y would be 16. So, part five. Uh, one teacher suggests that the best arrangement is to hire as many minibuses as possible. So we want X to be as big as possible. So looking in our area, we're going to be, we're going to be taking the 15 minibuses, because that's the total number available. So we will be taking the 15 minibuses and five coaches. So that would be 20 vehicles in total. So I've taken that point there, maximized my minibuses, and then taken as few coaches as possible. So that's five rather than anything more than five. Now, um, part six, we've now decided to try and get the, the combination of coaches and minibuses that minimizes the cost. Now that's gonna be up here, at the, this other extreme of my area. So that is when I have six minibuses and eight coaches. Six times 100 is 600. Eight times 150 is 1,200. So that's 1,800 pounds in total. Question 13. So for part A1, he goes along the path to O and then up to C across the moor. So all the way along to O, he's going to go four kilometers. He's doing that at five kilometers per hour. So he would go five kilometers in 60 minutes. So four kilometers is going to take us 40, 48 minutes. So that's the time taken from A to O. Now going from O to C, that's three kilometers when he's traveling at the smaller speed of two kilometers per hour. So he can go uh, two kilometers in 60 minutes. So three kilometers will take him 90 minutes. So the total cost uh, time of the journey from A to O and O to C is 48 plus 90, which is 138 minutes or two hours, 18 minutes. Now for A part two, he's gonna go direct from A to C across the moor. So this is just by way of Pythagoras. So the length he's going to do is gonna be um, 
from A to C is going to be uh, 4 squared plus 3 squared square rooted. So we just look at the triangle OCA where the base is 4, the height is 3, the hypotenuse is AC. So the distance that he would be travelling is going to be 5 kilometres. This is all across the moorlands, so travelling at 2 kilometres per hour. So that's going to take him 2.5 hours. Now, for, for B part 1, John finds that he can minimise the time taking the walk from A to C if he sets off towards O on the path, but at X, a distance of X from A, he turns to walk directly to C across the moor. So let's make this point X here. So what we're saying is he walk, walks from A to X and then walks directly across the moor to C. So that journey is going to comprise two bits. It's going to comprise him going from um, uh, A to X and then from X to C. So the time it takes him to X to C is going to be again by way of Pythagoras. The journey from O to X is going to be our 4 take away our X. So that's going to be 4 minus X all squared plus 3 squared. So x to c all squared is going to be that. So the square root uh, of that will be xc. Now, um, we've been asked to work out a f f an expression for the time it's going to take for this journey. Now, let's think about it. Speed equals distance over time. So time equals distance over speed. So the, t the, um, so the time um, he takes to get from A to X is going to be a distance of, of X but, and the speed while he's going along the path is at the 5 kilometers per hour. So that's going to be a distance of X over a speed of 5. That's going from A to X. Then secondly, going from X to C, the distance that he travels we've just worked out to be this divided by the speed he's going across the moor, which is at 2 kilometres per hour. So that's the total time taken. Now for B part 2, we're just going to substitute in, in turn, 2.6, 2.7 and 2.8 into the equation that we've just derived. And this gives us a time of the, these three times, respectively, of how long those journeys are going to take. So what we can see the time taken is gradually decreasing as we go all the time from x equals naught all the way down through 2.6 to 2.7. But from 2.7 to 2.8, the time starts increasing again. So t is decreasing from x being naught to 2.7. However, it's increasing from 2.7 to x being 4. So 2.7 is the smallest time um, it t yes, the t is smallest at x equals 2.7. So x being 2.7 is the shortest distance um, to minimise the time going from uh, A to C. Question 14. So we're being asked in part 1 to find the height of x above the baseline BC. So let's go and look at the triangle from B to what I'm calling G up to X, where G is directly below X on the ground. So what do I know about the triangle BGX? I know the angle XBG is 28. I know the hypotenuse BX is 100. And I want to work out the length of XG, which I'm calling little x. So sin of 20x equals my opposite side of x divided by my hypotenuse of 100. So x equals 100 sin 28, which is 46.95. Now for part uh, 2, I've got to find the length fx. Now the triangle I'm going to focus on here is the triangle f e to x, where I write at e it's a right angle. So what do I know about that triangle to start with? I know f to e is a thousand and I'm now going to focus on trying to work out what e to x is. Now to work out what e to x is I'm going to start off by looking at the triangle BCE where it's the right angle at C. 
So with that triangle, I know that the angle EBC is 28. I know my length EC is 200. So sin 28 is going to be 200 over BE, allowing me to work out that BE is 426 and a bit. So B to E is 426 and a bit, but I know that X to, uh, but I but I know that um, B to X is 100, and I've just worked out that B to E is 426. So therefore X to E is the difference, being 326.01. So I now know E to X. So then just doing a positive Pythagoras. I can work out the length of fx. So fx squared equals 1000 squared plus 326.01 squared, giving me fx being 1051.8. Now part three, hence calculate the angle of slope of the line fx. So I'm take, hooking out the triangle now, fyx, where I've got a right angle at y, I know that um, I've worked out that fx is 1051.8. I've just worked that out. And my length, I, I know it's easy for me to work out the length from f to y. Now, how do I do that? Well, I know that the length from d to y is the same as g to x, which I worked out right back at the beginning in part 1 because y is on FD such that XY is a horizontal. So this is a horizontal line. So this height from D to Y is 46.95. I know it's 200 all the way from D to Y. So the length from F to Y must be 200 less 46.95, which is 153.05. So I now know these two sides on this triangle, allowing me to work out my angle F x y so which i'm calling little y so sin y equals 153.05 over 1051.8 allowing me to work out that y is 8.37 degrees